You know that 10% thing? They said you do 10%, and you do 10%, not more, not less. They tithe dill and cumin. How many of you know what dill is? Not who, but what? You've heard of dill pickles, right? And that's not the name of dill. His name is not Mr. Pickle. But anyway, it, 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 it's dill, and there's a little tiny seed. So they would tithe. 10%, not more, not less. And tradition says that they counted out each single seed in a bushel so that it would make sure that they tithed only 10%. Okay? So you had to get in, the only way to get to heaven. And you take the top point and fold it down to your first right to left and now left to right. And that's how you get to heaven. They took God's Ten Commandments and made 613 for themselves. That's why they couldn't do anything on the Sabbath. They couldn't help anybody. So they said that's the only way. Now, to get to heaven by following the laws, when you fold it, fold it in half. That's right. I will give, I, I will show you, I, I will show you again. Okay, then, then, you, then you make the wings. And, and you probably have guessed sort of by now what I'm sort of trying to make. Has anybody guessed what I'm trying to make? What is it? Yeah, a paper airplane. Okay. Now, we were in the front, and this young man was willing to go up to the balcony to get this paper airplane for me. So would you do me a favor, and would you catch this for me? Okay. Getting to heaven is as easy by following the rules as it is for me to throw the paper airplane back to that gentleman there. Okay? You ready for it? Yeah, it does a U-turn. You can't do it. Even if I were to pick you up, put you on my little paper airplane, and wing you back. That's how easy it is to get to heaven. Can you do it? Can I do it? Could I? No. Nobody can do it. And you take it lengthwise. And hopefully it'll work for me just as good as it did earlier. So, but Bible class, you've been here for years. You've heard Pastor Rieger preach and teach about the very subject. What's the one and only way to get to heaven? Come on, you can talk out. Jesus, yeah. And how did Jesus do it for us? What? He did what? Died on the cross for us shed his blood for us. So that's how you do it. I will show you again. But there's more to the story. Because you see what's left over, you can take and you can put around the cross, and depending on how you place it, this is the thief that looked toward the cross. This is the thief that looked away from the cross. This is the spear which pierced his side. These are the die that were cast for his clothes. The whole story of salvation wrapped up in a sheet of paper. And then you can talk about Jesus as being the way, the truth, and the life. All wrapped up. However, we're talking about the large catechism, correct? We've got the sixth commandment in front of us. Like I say, I don't know how Pastor Rieger does it, so if you want to just take a look at that first paragraph there, I would just like to point out a couple of things. Um, the commandments overall... And I'm going to reach back into your confirmation understanding about this. The commandments overall tell us what? Overall, we're told the commandments tell us what to do and what not to do. There's two things in the commandment. What's the first commandment? 
Um, okay, I, I, you, you got, you, you're going to teach class for me today. Cause, okay. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We should fear and love God what? Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. What are the two, what is the, the sin of commission is to do what in breaking that commandment? To commit the sin, you what? Have no other, you have no other gods. That's, that's the committing it. You have other gods, rather. And what to do and what not to do. What to do is you worship him only. What not to do is what? Worship other gods, okay? Um, what's the, um, the, the, the fifth commandment? You just studied that last week. What's the fifth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Okay? So, what are we told? And in Luther's small catechism, we have the explanation. What are we told? What are we to do in that one? Do not... Do not kill. Do not hurt or harm our neighbor. Okay? Don't hurt or harm our neighbor. But there's the other half. And what is that? Help and... Befriend him in every bodily need. Okay. So we have in both commandments the sin of commission by actually committing the sin of having other gods before us and the sin of omission by failing to do that. If we fail to help our neighbor in his bodily need, then we too are also breaking the fifth commandment. So what's the sixth commandment? It's right there in front of you. I don't ask hard questions. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, so what are we to do, what are we not to do, the sin of commission and the sin of omission? What are we to do and not to do according to this commandment? Don't do what? Don't commit adultery. So what are we then to do? Live a chaste and decent life in word and deed. Take a look at that first paragraph. Commandments are easily understood. Second line. Commandments are easily understood. They teach us to guard against harming our neighbor in any way. First, they deal with our neighbor's person. Don't hurt or harm that person. And then, it says in the next sentence, then they proceed to the person nearest and dearest to him, namely his wife, who is one flesh and blood. Therefore, it is explicitly forbidden here to dishonor his wife. Don't do it. A little bit later on, if you want to get into the second paragraph, uh, number 203, uh, we'll, we'll go back up to 202, uh, second line. Not only is the external act forbidden, adultery, but also every kind of cause, motive, and means. Your heart, your lips, and your whole body are to be chaste and to afford no occasion, aid, or encouragement to unchastity. And we can understand that. That's the big thing. Don't do it. The thought, word, and deed. But sometimes we forget the second half. Now that's where that sentence number 203 comes in. Moreover, you are to defend, protect, and rescue the neighbor whenever he is in danger or need and on the contrary, to aid and assist him so that he may retain his honor. What do you think that's saying? So you look at the commandment and say, don't do this, don't do that. We look at the fifth commandment and say, okay, don't kill anybody, but help and befriend them in every bodily need. And so we say in this commandment, don't commit adultery, but yet we also have a tendency to fail to do what? According to this sentence. What do we need to do? Help our neighbor. 
So what does that mean? How do you help your neighbor when it comes to this commandment? Oh, by the way, who's your neighbor? Is this your neighbor? Okay. Really? She lives next door to you? Cool. Really? I don't think so. Oh, you're just pulling my leg. Who's your Yes. Okay. So, how do you help whoever God puts in your life with this commandment? You know, we can probably rattle off the commandments. And God says to keep the commandments. Oh, by the way, keeping the commandments, I'm going to pick on you because you saw this presentation twice. Keeping the commandments, that's how you get to heaven, right? Good for you. You get a gold star. No. So how do you apply this commandment to your life from the point of view that you are to help and assist your neighbor and keeping him and or her or whoever God puts in your life from unchastity, an indecent, immoral life? Now, the question is out there, and I'm going to be quiet until you share with me what you're thinking. How do you do that? Okay, we can be an example by not living with someone. Anything else? Okay, it's not wrong anymore uh, uh, in the eyes of the world. But in the eyes of the so what does that so what does that say to us? If somebody were to come up to you today and ask you, what do you believe, what would you say? If somebody were to come up to you today and ask you, what do you believe, what would you say? I would tell them I believe that the Holy Bible is true. Okay. What else do you believe? Okay, God so loved the world. How do I know that the word world means me? Okay. See, I'm going I'm to be sort of a, excuse the expression, devil's advocate. Okay, how do you know? Context of the whole world. The context of, it's in the context of scripture. We know who the world is. The world means me. Okay. But what do you believe? <coughs> Let me give you a, a, you probably all know this already, but I'm just confusing you. I believe in God the Father Almighty. You finish it. Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was, finish the rest of it. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian faith, communion of saints, communion of sin, et cetera, et cetera. So if somebody comes up to you and says, what do you believe? Oh, I believe that God is my heavenly father and he's almighty. And you know what he did? He made heaven and earth. Oh, I also know something about this Jesus. He came by God, sent into the world, so that all who believe in him, what? Might be saved, will have everlasting life. How do you talk to your neighbor about the sixth commandment? Tell them don't do it, but tell them what else?
what you believe and why you believe it. And what is the Sixth Commandment going to do to their life if they continue in that sin? Pardon me? Yeah, take them away from God. It's going to build up a wall. It's going to separate. That's what sin does. Sin separates. Have you ever been mad at somebody? Been angry with somebody? Been upset with somebody? And isn't it sometimes that because of that anger, you don't want to have anything to do with that person? At least for a little bit of time? Because what does sin do? Sin separates. How does the sin of the, of the Sixth Commandment separate? How does the sin of the Sixth Commandment separate? It puts spouses, what? At odds with each other. I've got to be away from you. Or you left me to participate in the sin over here. So how do we deal with that person next door? How do we first deal with that neighbor? As we would with any of the commandments. How do we protect their lives? How do we live a chaste and decent life? And yes, we do it by example. But is example going to be the only way that we are able to do it? Anything? Okay. How long should you keep on explaining, figuring that their ears are closed? Good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, right. It's also in your approach. You do it in gentleness and... Uh, gentleness and humility. You know, uh, I'm just going to pick on you, Doug, only because you're one of the few names that I know here. Uh, and I met you earlier, and I know that you're an elder. So, Why, you know what you're doing is absolutely wrong. It's terrible. You shouldn't do it because you're going to be condemned for it. And is that a good way to approach? No. Because what's that going to do right away? Put up a fence. And that's exactly what sin does also. It puts up a fence. Separates us from that which is godly and that which is, okay? So in meekness and gentleness and in humility, I have learned this. You connect your story with his story. Sixth commandment. Any of the commandments. Thought, word, and deed. Um, Anything else that you want to share with me about committing adultery? Now, somebody once told me that the Ten Commandments are how not to do things. It's not a study guide as to how to do things like that, how to break a commandment, okay? So what else do we talk about in, the, in adultery? Okay, you can t it's not just an affair, but what else is included in all of this? Particularly when we get into Luther's small catechism and he says lead a... Chaste and decent life in word and deed. Can you do that? Yes. Can you do that with God's help? Yes. The, the, the meaning of the cross is that sin is conquered through Christ, and we can conquer sin and temptation as it comes to us in our lives. Which commandment do you think would probably, well, no, that's, that's a loaded question. Which commandment do you think would probably be most broken in today's age with television and radio and movies? and Okay, yeah, the first one. Because everything else hangs, all the rest of them hang on the first one, okay? 
But what do they try to sell cosmetics with? What do they try to sell whiskey with? Toothpaste with? Cars with? You know, it all boils down to, yeah, leading into this, this thing. See? The adultery doesn't have to be in a physical thing. It just needs to be in your thought. How many of you would say that you're, on the average, fairly decent, morally, moral living Christians? I don't see any hands going up, so I mean, you must not be. <laughs> I said, how many of you are? Okay. Do you realize what Jesus has done for us? I mean, I would like to take a, stray away from here a little perspective as to what's going on. The, 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 uh, psycholo one psychologist, and I don't know how he came up with this figure, but he said that we think about an average of about 10,000 different thoughts in a day. Okay, 10,000 different thoughts. And assuming that we are an average, moral, decent Christian, let's say 5,000 of those are good thoughts. That leaves us 5,000 sinful thoughts. Now, if we do that daily, what I'd like you to do is apply a little math and take that 5,000 and multiply that by 365. And what do you come up with? Three hundred sixty-five times 5,000 comes up to 1,825,000. Now, what I would like you to do is multiply that by your age. If you're 10, it's 18 million. If you're 20, it's 36 million. Follow that. If you're 70, it's... My calculator doesn't go that high. Okay. Now, let's put some weight to those. Could you hold a single BB, like a BB shot from a gun? And you buy BBs for your BB gun at what, about 500 and a, something like that? Okay. You think you'd be able to lift 1.8 million BBs? What would happen if we took 1,825,000 BBs, put them in a container, hung them over your head by 20 feet, and then dropped them on you? Would you survive? You think you'd survive? Okay. How old are you, young man? 13. Okay, so you've got at least 18 million plus another 4 million on there, 22 million. 22 million, okay. Now let's do that. Now, now we'll take it, and you've done it for yourself, now we'll add it all up for all of us here in the room. All of the members of the church, all of the members of Hubbard, or the people that live in Hubbard, and Iowa Falls, and Iowa, and the United States, North America, the world, from those who have gone before us, starting with Adam, to those who have not yet lived and will live in the future, and add that all up. And what kind of a figure, a number do you get? It's staggering, isn't it? Now let's take all of those BBs at once and throw them on a single man's shoulder. Take all those BBs and shoot them rapid fire at a single man 10 feet away from you. Who's the single man that I'm talking about? Yeah. Talk about the tremendous weight and load that Jesus took on his shoulders. It's our weight and load. Now, 
That was just your thoughts. Now let's add word and deed to what he went through on the cross. It was necessary for him to do it because do you think we could have taken 1.8 million babies? How old are you, young lady? Okay, well, that's 1.8. You're over 22. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a tremendous one. And he did it for us for all commandments. And look at how we can break this sixth commandment in word and in deed. Um, he, goes, he goes in to say we should uh, take a look at verse uh, at number 209. Well, let's see. Yeah, 209. We should not despise or disdain marriage. Marriage is being disdained for today. Oh, well, we're going to get, why bother to get married? Because we're just liable to do what? Split up in a couple of years and it's, you know, lack of commitment or whatever it is that you want to do today. But God says marriage. If you look, I'm going to, I'm going to jump again. In uh, verse, uh, in uh, line number two, the end of 200, 201, the bottom of that first, first paragraph. Adultery is particularly mentioned because among the Jewish people, marriage was obligatory to get married. Everybody was to get married, and they got married as young as they possibly could. Um, don't disdain marriage, as people are doing now. Um, 211. Remember, it's not only an honorable estate, but it's a necessary one. Solemnly commanded by God that in general, men and women in all conditions who have been created for it shall be found in this estate. And then at the end of that 2.11, it says, Some who are unsuited for married life and others whom he has released by a... What are those next three words? High supernatural gift to maintain chastity outside of marriage. And then later on, he goes into talking about uh, in 2.16, to make it, e uh, well, let's see, um, 2.12, therefore to make it easier, the end of that one, to make it easier for a man to avoid unchastity in some measure God has established marriage. 2.16, then he goes into talking about priests and monks and nuns and, and everything, and in 2.16 he says, therefore all vows, uh, vows of chastity apart from marriage are condemned and annulled by this commandment. 217, to acquire a love for married life and know that it is a blessed and God-pleasing estate. So Luther is basically saying that, you know, what the, what, the, what, the, uh, what the monks and the nuns were doing, they shouldn't ought to be doing. And what's in the newspapers today about the monks or the priests? See? To vow a chaste and decent life and not get married and then get involved in all kinds of things that are contrary to the Sixth Commandment. And then in some places to cover it up, to hide it, to excuse it, to overlook it. And as you said, everybody, not in that vein, but all the things that are going on in the world today, it's simply approved. Homosexual relationships, living together outside of marriage, having affairs outside of marriage. It's just the way. Yeah, five years, 
well, they have a kid, then they get married. So what do you and do then, you get an invitation in the mail and you know they're living together? What do you do? Keep going? Tell me. What? Tell me. What do you do? Yeah, I know. We're all in the same boat, right? Make well, heaven forbid. oh, heaven forbid. Let me see. Oh, there was a there was a man who walked this earth that made waves wherever he went. I think his name started with a J. <laughs> to tell the truth and to do it in love. Why, why is it right that it's, well, not, it's okay, or we say that, no, that's not okay to do this, that, or the other thing, you know, to live together, and then all of a sudden it becomes our son or daughter. And all of a sudden, well, let's see, I think I better have a change of heart. I better have a change of mind. No. What has God said? Don't commit adultery. And I've told my confirmation kids, I says, do you realize that already while you're in the eighth grade that you have broken the sixth commandment? I said, well, how have we done that? I said, well, there's a couple of magazines out there that you may have looked at. Or if you tell stories that are inappropriate as if you've already committed adultery against your future wife or your future husband because God has someone for you. And you walk into a marriage, I'm not saying everybody does it, but you walk into a marriage already having committed adultery against that one that you have been with. We're going to be with. Sure. How many pins does it take to pop a balloon? One, right? You break one commandment, what? You've broken them all. What about the who? Oh, yeah. We had... <laughs> At the one church that we were at, um, they had a, I don't know what you call it, the sculpture, I guess you could, and it was a concave picture as opposed to a convex, like a bust that didn't stick out, but you go like this. And everywhere you walked, as you, when you walked through the room, if you were to look at that thing, just like you're doing now, is your eyes are following me. And that's okay, you can do that. So it almost like, like Jesus was looking at you. And so they had this, uh, this sculpture or whatever sitting on their television, and they were watching a program on TV that was of a questionable nature. That if Jesus would have been sitting with them, they probably would have either turned it off or been very uncomfortable. Well, Jesus was sitting with them on top of that television. And they actually told me, he says, yeah, we got, the more we watched that program, the more we saw Jesus up there, the more we became uncomfortable about it. So we took Jesus and we put him in another room. <laughs> and, then, and then what do you say to that? What should, they, what should they have done? Turn the TV off. Change the program. Do something. You know, and I suppose you could say this is one way, this is one way that we could um, take a look at all of the commandments. About anything we say or do is Jesus is right there. He may not be physically present, but he says, I am with you, what? Always. When we're sleeping, when we're awake, no matter what, when we're out in there brushing our teeth, combing our hair, doing whatever, he is with us always. And so the next time you tell a story, is it one that if Jesus were, you could say, hey, oh, oh, Jesus, hey, I heard this funny story on the way to Hubbard. Can you tell, can you tell it to him? 
If you can't, then what? Don't. If you're ready to punch somebody out, Lord, would you approve of or punching them out with my lips, what I say? Oh, would you mind, Lord, if I say? Okay. Or that thumb finds itself under a hammer. Excuse me, Lord. The devil tries to get at that which is our weakest point. And for many people, it seems to be this. To ignore his word, not just the commandments, but his word, period. That yes, I can get to heaven another way. Yes, I can do whatever I want, and I know that the Lord will forgive me. And then yet just keep on doing it. There's going to be a point in time in which the Lord is going to say, enough. He said it about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, enough. In Romans, he said he gave them up to their lifestyle because they weren't going to listen. The Pharaoh, enough. His heart was hardened. But it was already hardened before. God didn't do it. He had already done it. But we can be thankful for what Jesus has done for us. He kept the commandments perfectly because we couldn't and we can't. He died on the cross for us. He's taken that complete burden off of our shoulders, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, I guess it's time for me to go get, get ready. Any comments, questions? Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy especially when we can't keep your commandments, no matter which one it is, one or ten or anyone in between. And we're thankful that you took your, our sins upon yourself so that we might have that forgiveness because there's nothing that we can do to be able to, to win that. Thank you for your love. Help us to live our lives, decent Christian lives, as you would have us. And help us to invite you along wherever we go so that we can have your strength and your support. In Jesus' name, amen.